Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are doing a deck tech for Duskmorn's Zimone Mystery Unraveler Commander. Zimone is a 4 mana 3 3 with landfall. Whenever a land enters, manifest dread. If this is the first time this ability has resolved this turn, um, otherwise you may turn a permanent you control face up. To manifest dread, look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of those onto the battlefield face down as a 2 2 creature and the other into your graveyard. Turn it face up any time for its mana cost if it is a creature. Whew. This is some Simic good stuff landfall. So why play Zimone, right? A lot of reasons. Zimone's really good. Our board gets better and better just by getting more resources. Like we literally, it's incentive to ramp. The more we ramp, the more lands we have, the more lands we have, the more mana, the more mana, the more things we can do in a turn, and the higher mana spells we can cast. Real good. We also look at the top two cards of the deck. So when we manifest dread just by playing a land, we get a 2-2 out of it, and then we just pick which one we would rather have. If it's a creature, we could just keep it right there and then pay its mana cost and then flip it. Or we can just make it a land, have a 2-2 chump blocker, whatever. But either way, we get to pick what we keep and we get to pick what we get rid of. Um, instant speed effects also give us good value because it's only once a turn um, to manifest to put the top card there. Um, and then the second time it comes in, we can flip it out. So if there is a way that we could hypothetically play a land, two lands in a turn, we're basically playing a land, looking at the top two cards, picking which one we want to flip, playing another land, it flips. We have that new thing for basically no mana value, just playing two lands. So basically on that, she's a huge cost reducer, get a lot of mana, more mana is more options. And then also she's a very flexible build. This deck, I'd like to preface and say that this is just kind of the bones for a deck. Zimone, you can build any which way. Um, so this is just kind of bones, change it how you'd like. Just really just some good uh, tips and tricks I'd like. Here's the game plan. We don't need her. Like, just at the end of the day, we're Simic lands, right? We're always going to be able to just play lands, do Simic land stuff. We have a lot of those pieces to win through that. So early game, we just want to get down small value pieces, rocks, ramps, tiny things like exploration you'll know you'll see it um mid game we're going to want to play zimon and then after that we're going to want to play two land drops in a turn hopefully early game we can set that up so we do have a way to play two lands every turn um so late game play two lands and then manifest the top card manifest dread and then flip it cool channel and deck stuff the deck is pricey you guys will see throughout the video that some of the cards are artificially like pricey like if you get rid of these cards like you'll see like some cards like field of the dead i think it's necessary but field of the dead is like a 40 dollar card and eh, how about nixos nixos is in the deck spoiler alert it's like a 40 dollar card you can you can trim the fat on this to make it way cheaper um get the cards you need down from the link below and as always like comment and especially subscribe to the channel that helps it the most let's talk about battles we only have one of them and it's the invasion of zendikar and i'll tell you why so when invasion of zendikar enters the battlefield just search for two lands put them on the battlefield tapped so it's just that's like a nice easy way to get two lands onto the battlefield right away um which is cool so that it automatically triggers a moon and then if we want to beat it down uh we can attack and then it'll flip into um awaken skyclave which again is um a land when it's on the battlefield so when it, it's a land that will also trigger uh Zimon afterwards on another temporary attack it which is pretty cool Going into creatures, which is the main meat and cheese of the deck, we have AC Tyrant to the Gyre Strait. Like, this guy's a $40 card. Apparently only been reprinted once in the Commander Legends Commander decks. Didn't know that. Either way, 5 mana, 6, or 6 mana, 6 mana, 5, 5. You can play an additional land. Whenever a land enters, draw a card. That's so short, sweet, and to the point, and it's so good. So, another, we have a lot of play extra lands, um, which is good. Ancient Greenborn is really cool because we can play lands from the grave, and then since it triggers up our lands twice, one land will manifest the top card, and then it'll flip whatever we have. And the thing is, I want to mention, Zimone only cares about permanence. It doesn't have to be a creature. If it's a creature, we can pay its cost. Um, but if it's a permanent and we flip it up, uh, doesn't doesn't specify that so we can get permanents like lands and enchantments and artifacts so ancient great warden doubles that avengers and is good enters the battlefield makes a bunch of plants he's a five five worst case scenario so the deck is kind of tricky right avengers and assuming zimone doesn't exist he's a really good piece for simic right 
Avengers Endicar is one of the cards that we don't want to manifest dread. Like, even if we do, worst case, we flip it up and it's like a basically a vanilla 5-5 five because five, we're not going to have any other plants, which still isn't that bad just for playing two lands. Um, but ideally, we want to cast them and then play a lot of lands. Azusa, Lost with Seeking, you can play two additional lands, so now we can play three lands on our turn. Again, that's kind of what we're going for, is playing two lands and then getting something really cool. Bonnie Pal Clear Cutter is very neat. 6-5 Reach for some reason. When it enters the battlefield, create Bow, a legendary blue ox creature token with power and toughness equal to the number of lands we control. Already pretty good. Look at him in that art. And then whenever we attack, draw a card, and then you can put a land from your hand on the battle. It's important to mention that it doesn't matter if Bonnie attacks. It's just whenever we attack. So Bonnie doesn't have to attack, which is nice. Coiling Oracle, I think, is neat in the deck. When he enters, reveal the top card. If it's a land, put it onto the battlefield. Trigger Zamone. Cool. If not, put him on our hand. I like Coiling Oracle. <laughs> Den Protector. So... There are some cards we can just straight up raw cast as a morph. So Den Protector is a 2-mana 2-1. Two two Creatures with power less than Den Protector can't block it. It has Mega Morph, which is different than regular Morph, which is also different than Cloaking. It's different than Disguising. It's different than, um, what else is it different than? Manifesting? It's Mega Morph. It's better than all of them. <laughs> oh my god. Wizards, stop printing the same keyword over and over again. <laughs> so, Mega Morph. So, we can either play Zimone and then play Den Protector face down off Zimone, which is great. And then we can do the Mega Morph cast uh, to do its ability, which is when it's turned face up, return trigger card from your graveyard to our hand, which is cool. Or we can do it the old fashioned way. And by the old fashioned way, I mean using our brand new commander that isn't even out yet um, to flip it face up. So we'll still get flipped up, turn face up. So that effect will happen, which is nice. Dry to the Elysian Grove, just really a place. Play an additional land every turn. Cool. It's a good blocker in a pinch. Cadena's Silencer. Cadena is a really good pre-con for this deck. When it's turned face up, counter all abilities your opponents control. I just like it. I just like it. No more. It's like a big stifle, basically. And again, we can flip these up by playing lands. So we can Megamorph that for its cost, or we can just play two lands in a turn and then flip it over. Keru Spell Snatcher has a bigger morph, but again, this is the one where ideally we're playing it for free by playing an additional land. When it's turned face up, counter target spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard, and then we may cast that card without paying its mana cost so for as long as it remains exiled. Really, really good. So basically, we just steal someone's spell by playing two lands, which we're going to be doing anyways. Really cool. And that's why sometimes instant speed... Um, is good and we'll talk about we have a lot of ways to do it instant speed whether it's just playing actual instants that do that crashing cracking a fetch land whatever different ways we can do it cosmic butcher of truth and cosmic broken reality cosmic butcher of truth is here for two reasons one well he's actually here for a lot of reasons whenever we cast it draw four cards if we don't make if we don't morph this guy basically if we're not playing him face down or what is it if we're not manifesting dread him we're not dreading him out. We can still hard cast him, draw four, which is great. Or we have him there as a cheeky 2-2, two -two, and then we can flip him over and then have a 12-12 with Annihilator 4 on the battlefield for essentially playing two lands, which is good. Now the other part. So ideally, he's in the deck, so we can have Annihilator 4, like turn five, which is really cool. But it's also important when he's put into the graveyard from anywhere, its owner shuffles their graveyard into their library. Manifesting Dread puts the one onto the field as a 2-2 creature face down, and it puts the other in the graveyard. For some reason, we don't want Kozilek or whatever, he's going to shuffle our grave back into our deck, because we're manifesting Dread basically every single turn, uh, so we're basically milling one every single turn, so we can lose a lot of cards really quick, and he prevents that. Kozilek Broken Reality is good either way. Ideally, ideally we're casting him, right? Whenever you cast a spell, up to two players... Each manifests two cards from their hands. For each card manifested this way, you draw a card. The trick is, there's no other player but us. So we cast him, and we manifest two. Which is uh, the... What's it called? Basically just putting on the battlefield as a 2-2. You know, you know, manifest. And then we draw a card. Which is cool. Or, or we draw two cards, which is cool. And then other colorless creatures you control get plus three, plus two. So 
in a vacuum, he's really good. A 9-9 that also comes in with two 5-4s, which is great. But if he's on the battlefield and we choose to dread him out and we flip him over by playing two lands, then he just buffs up all of our other guys, which is still really good too. Lotus Cobra, it's a land staple. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, add one mana. We can just keep going. We can keep doing more and more effects. Oracle of Moldiah is kind of a non-bow in the deck. It's good because it lets us play um, an additional land on each of our turns, which is great. However, we have to play with the top card of our library revealed, so that means that each opponent and each player really just gets to see what we're dreading, um, which is tricky. But it's still fine, because it does. it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, even if you know it's coming, it doesn't matter. Rampaging Battles, super great. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, make a 4-4. Four -four. This whole deck is all about playing two lands a turn. So Rampaging Battles is basically what? A 6-6 six, six with Trample that also makes two 4-4s? Four great. Ramanomp Excavator, for when our lands go to the graveyard, we can mill them. That's like a nice thing I like with this deck, is when we're dreading, we can just choose to keep the one thing and then mill, which is nice. Uh, so then we can play it later. Sakura Tribe Builder is very funny in this deck. Sakura Tribe Builder, you sacrifice them, search your deck for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield. That's a funny way to get an instant speed thing. So we can play Sakura Tribe Builder and then just sacrifice him. So at the very worst, right? We have Sac Sakura Tribe Builder and Zimone on the field. We sack Sakura Tribe Builder. We then get a land. If it's the first land, we just manifest a 2-2 two -two or dread out a 2-2, two -two, which is good either way. So he can make it happen more than once. He's good. Scoot Swarm is Scoot Swarm. Same idea with Rampaging Ballast. Really, any of the landfall stuff. If we're our whole goal is playing two lands a turn, those, these kind of landfall cards can go nuts. We have six. He's Reach. Whenever it attacks, mill three. You can then put a land card from them on into our hand. Good for enough for me. And then as long as it's our turn, non-land permanents in our graveyard have Retrace. Retrace just means we can discard a card... Um, specifically, we can discard a land and then um, cast that card. So, basically, we can cast a card by discarding a land in addition to paying its other cost. So, it's good. We're milling a lot. Slogurk, because we're milling a lot. Whenever a land is put into a graveyard from anywhere, put a woman counter on them. Again, I like the idea of just, we have fetch lands, we have all these, whatever. Milling, even just like manifesting dread and choosing to put like a creature on the thing or a, a non land onto the field and then a creature. Sorry, then a land into the grave is good because it'll trigger Slogurk. Remove three counters from him, return into our hand, and then when he leaves, uh, again, not dies, not exiles, is what it is. Just when he leaves, return up to three target lands from our graveyard to our hand. So he kind of keeps fueling himself, which is really nice. And then even in a pinch, we can just get three lands back, make sure we're not missing triggers if we have like fetch lands or whatever spring heart nantuko insect monk for some reason i love it cool card landfall uh whenever a land enters the battlefield we can pay um two if it's attached to a creature we make a token that's a copy of that creature if we didn't make a token that way we just make an insect which is uh still pretty good so if it's by itself we make an insect if it's on a creature we can pay two make a copy of that creature ideally like rampaging battles or scoot swarm or whatever can kind of go nuts tatiova the uh og simic lands maybe not the og but really good simic lands commander whenever a land enters gain a life draw a card good enough for me thassa's deep dwelling as long as it's our turn it has the whole god stuff indestructible not a creature devotion yada at the beginning of your end step, exile up to one target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under our control. We are just going to blink our um, things, our manifest, our dreaded manifest things. We're going to blink our face down things. They're going to exile, and then they're going to come right back down. Uh, not face down, they're going to be face up. So it's just a good way, easy way on the end step to blink something without playing lands. And then the secret hidden mode of Thassa that no one remembers, tap another target creature for four mana. I'm not going to lie, guys, I play Brawl and whatever, and if I have Thassa in the Brawl deck, that, that, that she can close out games just by making sure something can't block. It's really good. Tireless Provisioner, Landfall, whenever land enters, make a treasure, which is basically better Lotus Cobra, or make a food, sack it, gain life. Really good. Either way, double the up mana on Landfall. We also have two Ulamogs. We have the Ceaseless Hunger. Again, these, I, these are good because we're big mana and we cast them, or... We flip them up, and now they're like 10 tens indestructible that have Annihilator and attacking defending player exiles the top 20. 
So we either cast him and we get rid of some things, or we flip him over, ideally, and uh, we have Annihilator 4 and Annihilate 20-year deck, which is kind of cool. Um, either way, big guys. Uvum All Hydra is definitely one of the ones we would like to... Um, one of the ones we would like to cast because we can search our deck for a land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Also, I'd like to say a sneaky thing you can do with like Uvamol Hydra and like any of these guys. Maybe the Annihilator guys are a bad example, but Uvamol Hydra is a good example. If we manifest Dread Uvamol Hydra and then we attack and then we play those two lands or whatever, like at instant speed by doing anything, like. If they choose to not block, now they have an Uva Maul Hydra, like, a tap. Like, we can do it at instant speed, which is really cool. Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Uro's good because he, when we manifest him, he's just there. He's not entering the battlefield as Uro. He's entering the battlefield as the manifested Dread. So then when we flip him over uh, by playing two lands, um, he's just there, and we don't have to sacrifice him. So then when we start attacking, we gain three life and draw a card and put a land... Um, from our hand onto the battlefield, which is really good. And then later, we don't we we care a reasonable amount about our graveyard uh, because we can shuffle it in with some of the Eldrazi Titans and some of the other stuff like Slogurk or whatever. But again, exiling like five instant sorceries, artifacts, whatever is like not that big of a deal if we want to get them back. Vorinclex, Voice of Hunger. Again, ideally, we're playing two lands and Vorinclex is being like flipped by turn five, so now we have double mana. And again. This is all stuff, assuming we're not casting them. Like, all of these cards are great because at least all of our non-instance, non-sorcery, all of our permanent cards, we can just look at them with the logic of, oh yeah, I'll just manifest Dread into that and then I'll flip it later by playing two lands. We're still casting spells on top of all of this. Like, this is just us ramping, which is good. And then the final creature, we have Titania, Voice of Gaia. Titania is a reach. Whenever one or more lands are put into your graveyard from anywhere, you gain two. Uh, so if we're doing the dreading when we mill, great. We can get two off that land if we choose to mill away a land. At the beginning of your upkeep, if there are four more land cards in your graveyard and you own both Ga uh, Titania, which we do because she's on the field, and Aragoth, that middle land, we can exile them and then flip them into Titania, Gaius, Incarnate. So, Aragoth enters the battlefield tapped unless we control a legendary green creature. We have like a handful of them. Handful. It's probably going to enter tapped. Just like realistically, it'll probably enter tapped, and that's okay. It taps for a green, and then we can just, um, at sorcery speed, mill three, and then whip out a 2-2 two -two green bear, which is not very good. But what it flips into is very good. It flips into Titania, Guy Incarnate. Whew, I'm going to take a breath for this one. Vigilance, Trample, Haste, Reach, Power and Toughness equal to the number of lands you control. When it enters, return all lands from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. That's just straight up going to flip all of our face down cards. And then we can pay four mana to put four woman counters on target land you control. It becomes a four or becomes a zero zero elemental with haste. It's still land. And again, that's still a four four. Whew. It's a crazy card. This card is so nuts. I've seen it resolve a handful of times and it's been brutal a handful of times. Going into sorceries, we have aggressive biomancy. All of these cards are cards that we cannot get. Um, instance and sorcerers we can't get with Zimun. But either way, Aggressive Biomancy, we're going to get a lot of mana, so this and Genesis Wave are kind of okay, so don't let those X scare you. Great X tokens that are a copy of target creature you control, except they have, when this creature enters the battlefield, it fights up to one target creature we don't control. Now, I like the idea of this in, like, Rampaging Ballast, or things with, like, ETB abilities, like Uro, or, like, whatever. We can kind of go nuts, and either way, it's a kind of like a nuke. Oh, it's like a nuke in the way, in a way. Genesis Wave, pay X for, like, a bunch Reveal the top X cards of your library. You may put any number of permanent cards with CMC X or less from among them onto the battlefield and then the rest into our grave. So they're either getting milled, which is okay, because uh, we can just get it back with like other stuff, or we're just playing a bunch of stuff. This is also one of those ones that's going to flip all of our things because we're going to have so many lands into the battlefield off Genesis Wave. Even like if X is like six, like nine mana, eight mana into it, can still be a lot. Life from the Loam is good. Just... Return up the three target lands from a graveyard to our hand. That's if we're milling. That's any kind of fetch lands or whatever. Because fetch lands are good because they trigger Zimun right away. You play them, land enters, you crack it, land enters. They're good. And then we can dredge three it. Um, dredge just means instead of drawing a card, we can mill three cards and then put life from the loan into our hand. That's all dredge is. 
And then the final two cards, Nature's Lore and Three Visits, which are the exact same thing. Search your library for a forest card, put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle. We can either get a basic forest, or we can get a breeding pool, or we can get the surveil land, which I think is called Hedge Maze. I don't know yet, still too new. But either way, it's going to, we're going to play land drop, Nature's Lore, late game, get another one, or early game, it's good ramp. Good card either way. Going into sorceries, um, really nothing too crazy. We just have Beast Within. All of it, a lot of this just interaction um, for these ones. Beast Within, destroy target permanent. They can have a beast, no big deal. Good removal. Counterspell is counterspell. Make sure something doesn't resolve. Crop Rotation, the way I look at this one is I think we just sacrifice a land and then we just get out Field of the Dead. In my opinion, Field of the Dead is just so strong for this deck because we're playing so many lands every turn. It's almost, almost necessary. Entish Restoration and Harrow are basically the same card. Um, obviously, Entish Restoration is a bit better. Sacrifice a land. Search your library for two basic land cards. Put them onto the battlefield tapped. If you control a creature with power four or greater, instead search your library for up to three basic land cards and put that on the battlefield tapped. Here's the important thing. With Harrow, Harrow is basically all that. It, just get rid of the power four or greater thing. You get sack a land, you get two basics, right? The cool thing about this is we do this on someone else's turn, which then means we get a Dread trigger from Zabon, and then we get a Flip trigger from Zabon for three mana, which again, is also still kind of ramping us, which is good either way. So it's an instant speed, trigger Zabon twice. Gross Boggle is great, draw a card, put a land from your hand on the battlefield tapped. Not tapped, just on the battlefield. I don't know why tapped, most of them just say that. Either way, really good. Good card draw, good ramp. We have Negate, just counter target non-creature spell. Get it out of here. We don't like it. It's good. Just, it's honestly underrated interaction, in my opinion. And then Roiling Regrowth is basically the same exact thing as the other two. Sack of land, search your deck for two basics, put them onto the battlefield tapped. That's it. Triggers a mounted instant speed for three mana. And then the final instant is Sink into Stupor, and it is also a land. Return target spell or non land permanent and opponent controls to its inner hand. So it's kind of like remand, basically. And then we can also play it as a land if need be, not an instant speed, I, w I wish. But we can play it as a land if we want. It can enter untapped for three life or it can just enter tapped. Either way, we just want to get these triggers happening for Zimone. That's kind of really how we're going to win. And I mean, landfall is still good. Going into artifacts, um, again, the rest of the deck is just stuff we can get with Zimone um, if we choose to manifest it. Arcane Signet is just good ramp. Conduit of Worlds and Crucible of Worlds are essentially just here for the same reason of you may play lands from your graveyard, um, which is good so we can play fetch lands from our graveyard. Even just playing a basic and being able to have multiple land drops every turn is good. Um, so we're always triggering as a moment, at least on our turn. Conduit of Worlds has the extra tap ability. Uh, generally, I don't think it's very worth it, but if you're in a pinch, you're in a pinch. Cryptic Coat enters the battlefield. Basically, you just cloak the top card of your deck, which is... Put it on the battlefield face down as a 2-2 with Ward 2. And then again, if it's a creature, you can pay its mana cost. It makes the creature plus 1, plus 0, oh, and can't be blocked. And then we can return Cryptic Coat to its owner's hand. Here's the cool thing about Cryptic Coat. Is the way that Cryptic Coat is supposed to work, right? Is we play Cryptic Coat for 3 mana. Ideally, we don't know what we're getting right? We don't know what we're getting. We can't really equip Cryptic Cloak to any creatures. Um, so ideally, we just have it be a creature, and then we can just flip it up, and then it's whatever that creature is now unblockable in plus one, plus one, or plus one, plus oh, which is good. And then we can bounce it, redo it over and over again. Cryptic Goat's kind of cool. <laughs> Horn agreed, whenever any player plays a land, that player draws a card. It's good and it's bad. It's bad because when our opponents play a land, they draw a card which is not good, but it's really good because whenever we play a land, we draw a card, and we probably are playing way more lands than our opponents. So, Horde of Greed's really good. Lightning Greaves is just protection to slap on Zimone. The deck doesn't need her to win, but she really does make it uh, the games go a bit faster. Scroll of Fate, tap it, manifest a card from your hand, just, car just any card from your hand onto the battlefield is a 2-2. Um, it can be fun if we have flip abilities if we want Zimone, um, let's say we're not, let's say hypothetically we're getting bad, um, manifesting dreads. Let's say that's happening bad. Um, we can at least cheese like a good card in like an Eldrazi on say Ulamog or whatever. Um, and then we can flip Ulamog easy. It's like, oh, if Ulamog's in our hand and we don't really, you know, it's turn five, we're probably not going to cast him anytime soon. 
um, we could at least cheese him in and have the Annihilator stuff start happening. Soul Ring is Soul Ring. It's good. And Thought Vessel, just to give us no max hand size. Little Mana Rock. It's good. Going into enchantments, we have Copy Land. You may have Copy Land enter the battlefield as any any land on the battlefield, except it's an enchantment to its other type. So it will enter as a land, which is good. So we still get the land thing. And then we can have it cop enter as a good land, like, say, Field of the Dead or any of the other ones, uh, so we can get extra value on that. Exploration, one mana just lets us play an additional land on each of our turns. Sounds good to me. Omniscience, um, we're going to manifest Dread that, and then we are going to play two lands and then flip it for free, so then we have a free Omniscience. And even if we don't do that, we'll play 10, and then, like, we're a big mana deck. That can happen. Ristic Study, it's Ristic Study. I, I tend to put it in all of my blue decks just because it's just too good. It's card it's either card advantage or taxes our opponents. Either way, it's really good. Um, and we can play it for free with Zimone. Secret Plans is a funny little card. Face down creatures you control get plus 0, plus 1. And then whenever a permanent you control is turned face up, draw a card. Ideally, we're having that happen every turn just by multiple land drops. Or at least on our turn, we're drawing an extra card. And then sometimes on opponents, it's still really good. Spelunking is good. Just when it enters, draw a card. And then we can put a land from our hand onto the battlefield. I don't think we have any caves. Maybe one or two caves. So we could gain four life. But just lands entering untapped is really really good um and it's also a little bit of card advantage so there, like there are some cards we really don't want to manifest with simone like spelunking obviously we're not going to get the enters ability um but still the static ability of lands entering untapped is still good and then we have trail of mystery whenever a face down creature enters the battlefield under your control you may search your library for a basic land card reveal it and put it into our hand here's the cool thing about that right is that creature is entering because we played a land so we played a land a face down creature now entered it tutors us up a land and now we can play that land to then turn over whatever that thing we just manifested was really cool and then whenever a permanent you control is turned face up if it's a creature it gets plus two plus two until end of turn that's good if we're doing like an attack let's say we're attacking with i don't know rampaging ballast right so trample six six we're like, okay, we attack you with this 2-2, two, two, and then we play it like an instant speed land or sack soccer or tri builder or whatever, and it's like, oh haha, ha, now it's a then instead of that 2-2, two, two, it's a trample 6-6 six, six that gets plus two plus two, so now it's a trample eight eight. Um we're really running it for the top effect, but the bottom effect is still good too. Going into lands, honestly, lands really aren't that crazy in this deck. I didn't want to do anything too crazy for lands because I again I make these decks just as the bones for you guys to build your decks around. So we have Breeding Pool because we can fetch it. Command Tower is good. Dream Root Cascade. Again, we're going to ideally have more than two other lands in our land deck. Um, Fabled Passage is an excellent fetch land. Just gets our basics. Um, Field of the Dead, I've mentioned so many times. It's just so good in our deck. Just by like playing multiple lands, just getting a 2-2 two -two zombie every time we play a land is really good. Hedge Maze, we can fetch it. It can enter tapped and surveil one, which is nice for a little card advantage. Or we can, in a funnier way, have this land enter, do the Hedge Maze trigger first um, to surveil one, and then we can choose if we want to manifest one of those. Handle and Harbor's good. We have a lot of basics. It's a good check land. Lotus Field is a funny land. I like the idea, and hear me out on this, ready? I like the idea normally of milling the lands and then getting it back later with like Roman Ump Excavator or Crucible or Conduit of Worlds or whatever. But I do like the idea of playing this as our as our creature. It's a 2-2 and then playing a land and flipping it. And now that'll be an untapped Lotus Field that will not sacrifice any lands. So that's pretty cool. Misty Rainforest, one of the pricier lands in the deck. It's just, you know, it's a fetch land. It's going to trigger, um, trigger Zimmo twice right away. Myriad Landscape is a cheeky way to do Zimone and enters tapped, which is not very good, but then we can pay two mana, sacrifice Myriad Landscape, search our library for up to two basic land cards that share a land type, and then put them on the battlefield tapped, which is really good because uh, that's instant speed getting two land drops, and so we then trigger Zimone twice, make a 2-2, two -two, and then flip it. Nick, though, so we're pretty green heavy in this deck, so I figure the devotion would be beneficial. Um, I mean, it's just good either way. Rejuvenating Springs ideally is always going to... Well, Rejuvenating Springs, I build these decks assuming that we have three opponents and a pot of four. So it's almost always going to enter untapped. And if your opponent... If you don't have two or more opponents, either like someone's dead 
or the game's about to be over either way. So it's a, it's a great card. It's almost always just going to enter on tap, though. Then we have Reliquary Tower to have no max hand size. We have Strip Mine, so we can do some kind of minor strip locking effects. I'm I'm crazy enough to want to add, and crazy and mean enough to add Strip Mine to the deck, but not mean enough to add like Wasteland and the other stuff to the deck. It's still just good if someone has problematic lands. I know we do in this deck. And then we have Talon Gates of Madara. When it enters the battlefield, up to one target creature phases out. It taps for a colorless. It's a gate for some reason. We can pay one mana and filter it, or we can just pay four mana to put ta uh, Talon Gates of Madara from our hand on the battlefield. Um, hence the up to one target creature phases out if someone wants to attack us. We just four mana whip this land into play, which is also good for Zamoon because then on someone else's turn, whip into play, we get a 2-2. The basics we have are really just 12 forests and 10 islands because we have so many things that involve getting basics. We kind of, like, you need to have a lot. So I think this deck has like 38 lands or whatever, maybe even 40 if we include MDFCs. Not 100% sure off the top of my head. But either way, we're good on lands. That's all I got for you guys. Thank you for watching. Get the cards you need down from the affiliate link below. And then, as always, like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I will uh, see you next time.